Thank you, uh, Mr. Osowski. We'll uh, start with uh, Mrs. Cousy for six minutes, please. The floor is yours, Mrs. Cousy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Imagine this. You are a public servant. You are someone who has made the decision to come and help your country. I made this decision. I personally made this decision as a member of the Canadian Foreign Service. You swear, you swear that you will act in, in your best capacity possible for the best interest of this country. Now imagine that the, the worst situation for your nation occurs since wartime, a pandemic, a pandemic, and you are forced to make the best decisions possible that you can in your position for your nation with the information that you have. You do your best. You navigate the system. But things go wrong. Things go wrong. The application that you are working on ends up in, to be a $54 million boondoggle, a stain on the government, which is already neck deep in boondoggles. Another instance of uh, possibly an ethical behavior by this government and certainly incompetent behavior by this government and a definite lack of oversight. But you tried your best because you were a public servant. The stress of the investigation of this $54 million, bo million dollar boondoggle gets to you. So you go on medical leave and you think things can't possibly get worse, but they get worse and they got worse for Cameron McDonald who was a director general at CBSA and uh, and Antonio Utano who was an ADM at the Canada Border Services Agency things got worse for them after coming here giving what their they believed was truthful testimony their heart felt testimony to speak truth to power to speak truth to Canadians when they were suspended but not only suspended suspended without pay. And for what reason? They claim that they were misled by senior CBSA officials. They were intimidated that this was retaliation, that this was an attempt to muzzle them, that this was uh, their the CBSA's opportunity to use them as a scapegoat. There were no allegations, no details, no evidence. What they did receive were threats, threats that decisions would be made if they were not compliant. So Ms. O'Gorman, I'm here to ask you today, on behalf of Mr. McDonald, on behalf of Mr. Utano, on behalf of public servants everywhere, on behalf of Canadians, why were Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano suspended without pay? CBSA is conducting an internal investigation. Neither of those individuals work Ms. for the Gorman, CBSA I right now. I believe anything that you say today, uh, uh, these canned speaking notes, when both Mr. McDonald and Ms. Rutano have stated that they were misled uh, by senior CBSA officials as to who even chose a rye can. This committee has found you not having spoken the truth before to this committee before. What, there's no reason we should release. Can you tell the committee then what evidence do you have of Mr. McDonald and Mr. Rutano for their suspension? Can you share with that, please? What evidence do you have for this committee? I'm not using speaking points, and I and I don't believe I've been informed of not having told the truth to this committee. I did not take those actions. They don't work for me. Well, we would like to know what, what evidence you had. That was my question. As well, their legal fees were being paid until uh, this point of their suspension, and now they're no longer being paid. Why did you suspend paying their legal fees? So the preliminary statements of fact were provided to their deputy heads. And I took decisions that were consistent, that are consistent with the Treasury Board policy on legal fees. Yeah, th this information isn't providing any new information to us, uh, Ms. O'Gorman. Is this the type of treatment that CBSA whistleblowers can expect in the future? Is this the type of treatment that public servants can expect in the future? The CBSA was also made to know of threats against Mr. McDonald by Mr. Doan. What steps then can you tell us did you take to protect uh, Mr. McDonald from facing negative reprisals from, from higher ups, please? I heard that testimony here. There are processes and systems in place when somebody believes they've been subject to harassment. I'm trying to conclude an investigation. My interest is understanding what happened. 
You I don't an understand. You need to speak the truth to people here today. Just tell us, tell Canadians, why were they suspended without pay? Share that with everyone. I did not take that action, and it's not for me to talk about. Their okay. deputy heads Minister took that Zosky. action. There are accusations that the public safety minister at the time was wanting someone's head on a plate. How involved was that current minister in the building of Arrive Can? And how involved was that minister's office in covering up the misconduct connected to the development of the Arrive Can app? Comments occurred after I retired. I can Again, speak. I can speak okay, to that. Go ahead, Mrs. Berman. The Minister of Public Safety was informed by me that we were launching an investigation. He expressed concern over the nature of the allegations, and he indicated that he expected me to deal with any gaps that they showed and to go forward with the investigation and to let him know if there were any pertinent information that he should be aware of. He never said that he was looking for anybody's head on a platter. Well, we were also uh, advised, <clears throat> I apologize. Uh, that is our time, Mrs. Kusi. Uh, Ms. Atwin, over to you for six minutes, and welcome back, Dogo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good to see everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, and thank you so much to our witnesses uh, for, for coming back to the committee today. Um, I know last time it was a, you know, you're in the hot seat as well, and it was a, a bit of a difficult conversation, and it seems we're off to a similar start today. Um, but I'd really like to, I think, you know, Mr. Osowski, you mentioned the importance of, of highlighting just how much work, as well as Ms. O'Gorman, what the CBSA does for Canadians uh, protecting our borders. Um, I really think it's important for us to separate kind of what's happening here with this important <laughs> integral work that we have. Um, and of course, what they endured during the pandemic, uh, very much so the front line, um, dealing with a lot of the you know, pent up anger and hostilities, even from, you know, community members who are just dealing with the, the uncertainties of that time. So just want to thank you uh, for, for everything you've done. Um, and of course, for, your, you know, providing your testimony for this very important study. And we, we certainly all want to get to the bottom of, of what occurred. Um, so I very much appreciate your opening statements as well. And, you know, really what I'm going to do is just kind of take us through, um, again, step by step, how we kind of got to this, this place. Um, perhaps quite repetitive at this point, because again, um, this is, has been quite an ongoing saga. Um, but Ms. O'Gorman, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll begin with you. Um, can you confirm again for the committee, just for complete clarity, um, when the investigation into this matter was first launched, as far as your role as, as president? Sure. Um, in, um, I received information, I received the allegations in the fall of 2022, and I provided it to our um, um, Director General of Security, who launched an, launched an investigation in November. Great, thank you. Um, and of course, this investigation, it's, it remains ongoing. Is that correct? Yes. So we'll certainly know more, you know, once the investigation is, is complete. Um, and of course, the RCMP, they're also conducting their own investigation. Is that correct? I'm not aware of whether the uh, RCMP is, investing in, uh, is conducting an investigation. So as I've testified before, we provided um, the material that we received to the RCMP. They've indicated that should they wish to have any information, they will seek it through a production order, and we stand ready to give them whatever they, they seek. I, so I, I don't know if they are conducting an investigation. I do know they have the information and the allegations. Okay, thank you. Um, and I also in your opening statement, you mentioned a bit about some of the changes around procurement practices um, in the CBSA uh, since you've become president. Um, and just if you could further clarify some of those changes, you mentioned some really great ones. Um, I think particularly the, the senior oversight piece is, is really important just to ensure that everybody's got eyes on something. So hopefully we can avoid this in, in the future. Um, but can you just provide further detail to some of those changes um, and perhaps, you know, add clarity to were these changes instituted specifically because of you know, what we're seeing right now around the arrive can experience, as I'll call it, or or were there intentions to kind of tighten things up around procurement ahead of that? So I'll just speak to you, the first part of your question. Um, so some of the changes, indeed, um, all contracts, task authorizations are coming through a senior executive committee now to look to, to conduct a challenge function. And we've centralized all procurement into one branch. So what I've seen was a breakdown of roles and responsibilities. I saw engagements with contractors without seeing the presence of procurement officials. Pro procurement officials play an important role beyond signing documents. And so Based on what I've seen, I felt that there was a breakdown and a lack of controls, and that's what I've put in place 
There will be more recommendations to come. We'll calibrate. Um, perhaps all have uh, been found to have overreacted and, and slowed things down. Um, but right now, given what I've seen, um, that's what I've put in place. And at the same time, trying to use fewer contractors. Great. Um, and just for the second part of that question, were there any intentions to tighten up kind of procurement processes or, or look at improvements uh, ahead of this Arrive Can experience, or is it really kind of coming out of what we've seen over the last few months? Coincided um, with me assuming this role. So um, I, I didn't have much runway to uh, examine or consider the procurement function. When I started, there was nothing glaringly absent, um, but some of this information and the allegations came to me early in my tenure, so I acted. Great. Um, and as our current president of the CPSA, uh, do you have faith in the organization's ability overall to follow fair procurement practices uh, moving forward? I have absolute faith in the organization, um, including in procurement practices. We're dealing and trying to get to the bottom of uh, a set of actions and um, work by individuals that you know, uh, I'm looking forward to an investigation to conclude on. Um, but I have absolute confidence in the CBSA and its application and adherence to policies. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Osowski, uh, if I can just switch to you now. Um, and again, bringing us back to this, you know, in the midst of the pandemic and some of the things um, that, were, that were being experienced and, and the necessity to act. And I'm just wondering, what data uh, were the provinces asked for at the onset of the pandemic? Um, and how is that data crucial to help in, inform public health officials on how best to protect Canadians from COVID-19 in the context of, of CBSA? Thank you for the question. Um, and it was actually quite interesting this past weekend reviewing my business records and seeing some of the back and forth in terms of the initial requirements. Provinces, in fact, were developing their own applications. Airports had developed some of their own applications. Mostly what we were interested in and the public health agency was wanting from us was the collector of collection of the contact tracing information. Where are you coming from? Name, address. This was being passed off to the provinces so they could monitor people on their arrival in case they needed to uh, ensure that their health was in yeah. place. I'm afraid I have to cut you off there because we're past our six minutes, but perhaps the next round. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, please, for six minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. O'Gorman, O'Gorman, does CBSA have a policy or a rule to protect civil servants in case of uh, suits um, uh, linked to their employment, for instance, by paying their lawyer fees, for instance, by paying their lawyers' fees, we follow the um, Treasury Board policies. We are subject to those policies. Thank you. So before they were suspended, Mr. McDonald and Utano had lawyers helping them that were paid by CBSA. As I've said, I made decisions that align with the policies in place. I know certain things were um, published or certain sentiments were made public, but my answer is that I was in line with policies. So the lawyers were paid by CBSA following the policies and rules in place. Is that correct? I would say that there are two ways to pay lawyer, the lawyers, and I'm sorry, I will switch to English for this. This is before parliamentary committees mm -hmm. and in legal proceedings. Okay. And the criteria are set out, and I am consistent with that policy and the decisions that I've made. Actuellement, est-ce que... Currently... Are those two civil servants still covered by this protection policy? Do they still have lawyers whose fees are being paid by taxpayers, basically? If I receive requests, I can make decisions. I've made decisions for every request that I have received. Now, the usual meeting places for civil servants and potential or current service providers, where, where do those meetings usually take place? I would say it happens in the workplace. Now, that's not to say that there are no meetings outside. 
there are no set rules. Um, no set rules about the exact location of such meetings. We do have a values and ethics code that we follow. There's the question of conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest, and that guides us when we decide how and where to meet with vendors. In the emails that you've sent us uh, this week, I saw many meetings, um, either weekly or biweekly, that took places in, in bars, that were in breweries, and uh, those were maybe meetings that lasting an hour, hour and a half. Is this usual? Is this recommended? Is it efficient? I mean, I'm sorry, but having a meeting in a brewery, I don't drink beer myself, but <laughs> come on. Uh, three things on this. First of all, as I've said, the perception on conflict of interest matters. If I receive many, um, many requests, I mean, the investigation in, is underway. I don't know if the people in question were there, but the presence itself of such invitations with vendors, where there's no proof that there was an employee from our side, is something that concerns me. I have questions about this. Mr. Osowski, in your opening remarks, you compared the internal data storage and external data storage offered by Deloitte. I'd like to talk about Amazon Web Services. Is that considered internal or external storage? From what I can see in the documents we've received so far, the applications have to be compatible and use that platform. So is it considered internal or external storage? Question. Actually, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Okay. <laughs> you, okay. you need someone with a technology background. I mean, I think that the point was uh, that Mr. Duan was likely making was it was in an instance that was in the government's control as opposed to a private sector entity's instance uh, of where that cloud was, but I really can't comment on the technicalities of that. Okay. Um, so you probably remember that during the pandemic, Deloitte was in charge of everything regarding procurement in China, and I'm talking here about cargo shipping, planes, um, ships in terms of masks and other PPE for Canada. Now, given this, would Deloitte have been available to, to work on this web application? Or did they have too much to do in terms of procurement for healthcare and PPE? Brief uh, answer. Uh, I think that, uh, that Deloitte was available okay. to provide this outsourced solution that was proposed. Merci. Mr. Johns, go ahead, please. Thank you very much for both of you for being here and coming back here and for the important work that you do and have done for Canada. Um, I just wanted to start with you, Ms. O'Gorman. I'm, I'm going to read from an email uh, Cameron McDonald sent to Ming Don on November 19th, 2019. Cameron says Ming directed him to, quote, look into a specific domain within HR using AI, end quote. He says, quote, I found a company in Montreal and connected with GC Strategies who sought options to move something forward, end quote. That company was Bother AI. So what we have here is a government official saying they clearly identified a solution but they chose to bring in a middle person to profit off it first. We've seen the direct message that GC Strategies sent to Bottler on LinkedIn. That's not professional headhunting that the government can't do itself. It really seems that GC Strategies was brought in as a middle person for no reason at all, 
except to profit off a taxpayer contract, um, a tax- taxpayer paid contract. And unless we see evidence to the contrary, that's what this shows. So, Ms. Gorman, do you believe this is, is uh, acceptable? And with many more eyes on CBSA's procurements right now, have you found other cases where this has happened? And what is your plan to figure out whether this is happening in other cases? Well, note your comment about unless other information comes to the fore. But to your question, um, I don't agree that that was proper procurement. It was not an unsolicited proposal. The rules allow for prime contractors to sub, and as this committee has has heard and asked about, sub-subcontract. It's not for CBSA or a department to try and manage and develop those subcontracts. Those are business decisions between entities in the course of a procurement. So what I have seen, based on the documents that you're referring to, CBSA's involvement in how those contracts would come together is not usual. Um, looking at other options, CBSA presumably could have put out an RFP for its requirements. It could have looked to justify a sole source. It could have used uh, supply arrangements and pre-qualified. So there were other options. It's not clear to me that what was happening was um, appropriate. In fact, it appears to be inappropriate. And the spirit of the supply arrangements and standing offers is not to retrofit products through them. Would be the, this be your rationale for the suspensions then? The suspensions of the companies? No, the employees. I didn't Mr. Sus- McDonald. I didn't suspend the employees. Okay, it's my understanding that is Mr. McDonald not suspended. So neither Mr. McDonald nor Mr. Utano work for the CBSA. I have no authority over them. Their deputy heads have taken action. Okay, understanding that, what's your plan to figure out whether this is happening in other cases? Have you looked to see if this is taking place in more than this instance? So uh, twofold, Uh, I have the investigation underway and the investigation is going to canvas all of those issues and I have a a committee set up that's looking at every contract and asking the questions and trying to understand before any approvals are given. Okay, now that you've got this committee working, has the committee come back to you already and flagged other contracts that are of concern? So um, the committee is forward-looking. Um, we are reviewing documents relating to contracts on ArriveCAN and the billing around that. Um, so uh, to your question, I have the internal investigation that will be canvassing how CBSA was engaging with contractors during this period, not limited to Botler GC strategies. So I look forward to those conclusions. I look forward to... When do we expect to have those conclusions? I mean, this could run for years, right? We don't want that. We want to make sure that we get results. That's what this committee wants. I'm very impatient. I need to make sure I don't translate that impatience into undue pressure. I'm trying to preserve the integrity of the investigation. I'm impatient, and I, I hope that everybody involved will participate so that we can wrap it up as soon as possible. I would hesitate to give a date at this time. Um, Mr. Azowski, you know, we've been told that GC Strategies was chosen over Deloitte because Deloitte was in the penalty box, and you commented about that earlier, but it was highlighted that it was for its poor wrote, poor work on the CARM contract. But Mr. Doan says that's not the reason. So why was Deloitte in the penalty box or, or even aware of why? And what was the nature of the problems with Deloitte's work? As I said in my opening remarks, the relationship was businesslike and cordial at that time. No one was in the penalty box. I reviewed all the emails, and there's nothing to suggest it was anything different than that. It was normal. Okay, Ms. McCormick, can you comment on that since uh, you're, in, you're in the current uh, role? I can't comment about the statements that were being made, um, but I would say that the cordial and businesslike relationship continues. So Deloitte's never been in the penalty box, or in, in your view, under your watch? And you're not aware of that in the past? No. Thank you, Mr. So Don. Okay. Mr. Brock, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, Ms. O'Gorman, your responses to the questions put to you by my colleague, Ms. Cousy, as to why both uh, Mr. McDonald, who was a Director General of the CBSA, and Mr. Antonio Utano, who was um, a Vice President of uh, the CBSA, as to why they were suspended without pay, I find your responses to be lacking in clarity. Clearly you know a lot more. Uh, we're going to ask you questions about that because uh, Canadians deserve a full, frank answer as to why both of these senior civil servants have been treated in the fashion that they have. And these are extremely unusual circumstances, so much so that uh, the report put, put forth by uh, Bill Curry in the Globe and Mail um, was able to, uh, to, to speak with the former uh, clerk of the Privy Council office, Mr. Michael Wernick, who said that uh, public finger pointing by senior servants is highly unusual. He cannot recall any other instance of such public disagreement. Is it an outlier? Yes. Suspensions without pay are also rare. It's a strong measure to suspend without pay while a process is underway and no conclusions have been reached. Usually disciplinary measures follow an investigation being completed and suspension with pay is more common in the early stages, he said. It's also a very strong measure to suspend or permanently revoke a security clearance. It is tantamount to removing someone from that job and any other job that requires that level of clearance. It is not a common occurrence. Your decisions at the CBSA as directed and delivered to the other ministries these two individuals have worked for have destroyed their lives. And Canadians deserve an answer, parliamentarians deserve an answer as to why due process was not provided to them, that very draconian measures were taken against them. So I'm going to be asking you a number of questions. Who did you speak with, ma'am, on suspending the two public servants on the 54 million arrive can app. You said it wasn't your decision, but clearly you participated in, in the ultimate recommendation that they be removed. Who did you speak with? That's not accurate at all. I didn't speak to either of their deputy heads about the actions they were taking. You received a preliminary report from investigators in your department. Did those investigators recommend suspension? No. Who did? taken by the deputy heads. I shared the preliminary statements of fact with their deputy heads. Well, what, did the, what, did the, what did the preliminary statements of fact, how was it so damning against those two individuals that you felt it prudent to pass on to the other ministries? Um, it included, in, as the emails that, that you have received, information about engagements with consultants, um, a whole series of information that as their deputy heads, I felt they had a right to have. They did not consult me on their actions. Why did you claim that they were a national security risk? I never claimed that. Were you aware that that was the language that was used in their suspension letters? I haven't seen their suspension letters. You're completely blind to that. You had no knowledge of that. I'm not their deputy head. They don't And the deputy me. head never spoke to you at all? They, they alone made that decision? They alone made is, that is decision. Is your evidence today? They alone made that decision. Okay, so identify those deputy heads for us, please. Who are they? Um, Bob Hamilton is the commissioner of the CRA, and Stephen Lucas is the deputy head of Health Canada. How many communications did you have with both of those individuals? I let them know that I would be sharing wow. a... Pro pardon? How did you let them know? Emails? Telephone um, call? Letter? I I called them and I indicated. When did you call? When? When? Um, soon after I received it. I received uh, the package the 19th of December. Follow up with an email? Um, possibly. Okay. Um, You'll provide this committee with any and all ma manners of communication to those two deputy heads surrounding the preliminary findings from your investigators in your ministry. You can do that? And, and, the, and you can uh, have that to us within two weeks? Okay. Yeah. Did they communicate back to you? They told me after the facts, the after the fact, the decision they had taken. They 
communicated that they took the decision to suspend without pay? They informed me that they had taken actions. And they communicated that to you in what manner? Um, in a phone call, as I recall. Nothing official, nothing, no email, no letter? No Just a phone to call? They me officially. They are the deputy heads of those employees. Right, that we're taking the most drastic yeah, of Can you remedies wrap up, Mr. Brock? against, that we're taking the most drastic of remedies against these two whistleblowers who spoke truth to power, and they only communicated that via telephone. The employees work for them. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Uh, Mr. Baines, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to Mr. Oskowski. You were, um, you were trying to inform us a little bit about the ArriveCan app and, and, uh, and the centralization of it in order for it not to fall through uh, cracks of uh, airport and provincial apps. Could you maybe finish that? You, I think you were trying uh, to... Sorry, let me interrupt no, you, Mr. Baines, for a moment. I'll stop the clock. Madame uh, Lignon? The sound is too mauvais for the interpretation, and I would like to hear the questions. The sound is not good enough for interpretation, and I would like to hear the questions asked by my colleagues, so maybe if he could move his microphone closer to his mouth. Can I hear these questions via the interpretation, please? May, uh, can you please move the microphone closely to your mouth so that I can hear the interpretation? How about now? Is this good? Is this better? Can, we get him to speak a bit longer? can you speak Once a bit again, longer, um, Mr. Uh, Baines? Uh, uh, just Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Merci. We'll go to Mr. Osowski. Are we still good? Or A little bit longer? Uh, just, yeah, just keep yeah, speaking a bit longer, please, Mr. Baines. Tell us about the Vancouver Canucks, how they're doing this year. Well, the Vancouver Canucks, as you see, we are very proud to send uh, five members of the Vancouver Canucks to the All-Star Game. In, uh, and uh, we, it looks like we have a Norris uh, candidate in Quinn Hughes. And um, yeah, it looks like we're going to have to good. pay a uh, lot of money colleagues, to Elias Pettersson. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Baines. Just bear with us. Couple moments while we check with the uh, translation booth. We're going to. I apologize. We're going to sp suspend for a couple moments here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Ozowski, I'm going to go back to you. Um, you, you are reflecting as um, uh, on on your observation and uh, um, what you notice when when you're going to through a number of emails and you were talking about uh, the 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 reach out to you or the outreach to you around. Uh, various requirements from various provinces and all of those things. Can you expand on that? And um, had, had we not gone with the RiveCan the way we did, um, what would be potentially the impact? Thank you for the question. Um, I think the best, you know, when I was looking through my emails, the best way I would describe it is that, um, and the, the memories that I uh, were refreshed was the airports were clogged with people trying to fill out paper forms. People then would get garbage bags full of these paper forms and have to digitize them so that information could be passed to provinces. You might recall at some point provinces were looking at checking in on people to see if they're okay. They were trying to make sure that they were enforcing mandatory isolation. Initially it was done on a sampling basis and then it moved to something more persistent. I think the initial piece at the airport as well was complicated because you had all these people getting off an airplane all at the same time, and they were concerned, quite frankly, of a super spreading event happening while they were waiting, doing the paper process. So it was logical to sort of look for some way to capture this information in advance if possible, and there was a web-based version of this as well for people who didn't have a mobile app, so that we could capture that very simple information give it to the provinces, and as well allow the public health agency to do the analytics to say, okay, this person came from this country, this is what variant that turned out to be following the testing. Um, it was um, 
much, much more sophisticated and much, much more effective than a paper process. Yeah, thank you. So the reference to a $54 million uh, uh, bongle is, is not really true because uh, can, can you share with us, if you do know, the, the, the dollar cost of the development of the application? I don't have those details, but I remember you asking me a similar question on December 8th of 2022 when I first appeared. And I think at the time, the estimate was the processing of a paper form was about $3 per form, and that the application was, I don't know, we, I think we talked about 60 million people used the application, or 60 million tra travelers, and that worked out to about 65 cents per form. But I think I want to take the opportunity, if I may, in terms of the cost of this. Um, unlike all of the other references this committee has heard to what an app costs to development, we did not know the requirements at the time. We did not have the luxury of weeks of thinking about how do we want to situate this, what are the true business requirements, what data we have. As you I can appreciate from my remarks, the, what we were dealing with was um, a million different things at once, quite frankly. And this constantly evolved as we brought in new measures and the public health agency, along with our provincial counterparts, tried to prevent the spread of the disease based on what was coming into the country. And that's where we tried it to help them. And so, you know, these references, well, we could have done an app cheaper than this. It was not the same situation by any means whatsoever. Yeah. J j just as a reference for the committee, I believe the development cost of the application with 70 uh, different iteration that was coming on a rapid fire was around $9 million. So the reference to the fact that this application has cost $54 million of development uh, is not, uh, it, it's not factually correct. Uh, quickly going to Ms. O'Gorman, um, in your opening remarks, you talked about uh, that... Um, the investigation had led uh, to uh, information that you shared with uh, with other department heads, and then they made the decision that they made. Um, also, some of our colleagues uh, uh, in the opposite side refer to the statement that you provided was not a true statement. Uh, uh, Madam O'Gorman, can, can you tell us why did you ask for an in-camera meeting uh, as opposed to a public meeting? As I said, I, I'm trying to balance information that this committee is seeking with the integrity of investigation that remains ongoing and that hasn't heard from key individuals. So I'm anxious for that to conclude, and I'm very conscious of not prejudicing that investigation. Um, CBSA conducts uh, internal investigations Individuals who have been subject to those investigations have talked to me about how stressful they can be, whether they're respondents or even witnesses. So I can't imagine the stress that would cause somebody who's subject to an investigation with such a public profile. I'm concerned about people's mental health. I would like the investigation to have the space to conclude, and I would like to protect its integrity. Those were the reasons why I asked. Thank you very much, and Mr. Jouari, thank you for your flexibility. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, for two and a half, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Ms. O'Gorman, as far as you know, are there public servants or higher-ups that would have made pressure or pressured people that would have uh, testified in committee. So Mr. McDonald, Mr. Utano, Ms. Doc, would they have been sent to cease and desist letters or other, uh, other legal documents? We should wait for the conclusion of the um, investigation in testimonies. Different informations have been, have been shared. I'm not sure I understand what whistles are being blown. I want to get to the bottom of what happened. I have trust in the investigation, and I look forward to it concluding. Il y a eu des pressions. C'est en dehors de votre. And so, if there was pressure, that is, that had nothing to do with you. And uh, these people acted of their own volition. They were their own decisions. Yes. Do 
during this investigation, did you ask that the investigators uh, meet with everyone involved? Was there a request uh, for meetings? I think that Botler AI was asked to share the information that they had in their possession. I don't know if the team asked to meet with Butler AI. When I read the contract uh, or the call for tenders, I saw that there were some linguistic uh, demands and that everything was done in English. Uh, we are or they were asked to work in English only F and French when it is mentioned, which is quite rare. It there's a condition, so you could have to work bilingually. So not only in French, but in a bilingual manner, whereas English is mandatory. So Chinese programmers, Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian programmers only program in English as well? Or can we hire specialists that speak another language? We didn't leave enough time for an answer, but perhaps you can get back to that next round. Uh, Mr. Johns, please, for two and a half. Yeah, Ms. O'Gorman, uh, can you please tell me the date in which CBSA officials commenced the internal investigation into Botler's allegations, as well as the date in which the Botler task authorization was cancelled? back. Um, the investigation was uh, late fall in November, I believe. I don't know the exact date. And I don't know when the task authorization was cancelled. That was before I was at the agency. Okay. I thought Mr. McDonald said that the investigation started in January, but I'll go to the next question. I have a few questions about Mr. McDonald's claims that CBSA was covering his and Mr. Utano's legal fees. When did CBSA begin covering their fees with private legal counsel? who made that decision, and does this include legal fees related to the RCMP investigation for McDonald and Utano? So I'm going to speak generally um, about covering legal fees. There are um, criteria um, in terms of determining whether legal fees should be covered. The criteria are different for appearances before parliamentary committees and legal investigations. Any requests that I received to cover legal fees were consistent with the policy. Okay, okay. Do you recognize the, the concerns and, you know, the conflict of interest in using taxpayer dollars to fund the private legal counsel of the same individuals who are under investigation by the RCMP, by this committee, and by your own agency? So I'll just clarify. I, I don't know if anybody is under investigation by the RCMP. I have no information oh. about that one way or the other. Um, I applied the Treasury Board policy on, on legal fees for uh, public servants. Okay. Um, so can you explain why the Department of Justice wasn't uh, taking the lead in terms of providing counsel? And also, just lastly, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you could table the date in which the internal investigation into Butler's allegations were made, if you could table that to this committee. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for all that. We can provide I'm that. Sorry. We you can, can provide that in writing? We can provide the date. And, and to your other question about legal fees, um, can you repeat the question? Why wasn't the council being provided by the Department of Justice? I will um, speak generally uh, about the process and... Just, just briefly, please. So I, I applied the policy and it does contemplate whether there's a conflict of interest um, that, that's in the policy. It, set, it sets out the considerations to be made. Thanks very much. Mr. Barrett, please. Mr. Gorman, in your calendar there are... Um, multiple visits to uh, the address 80 Wellington and uh, while this building is on Wellington Street it's not 80 Wellington 80 Wellington is the Prime Minister's office 
These visits are interspersed uh, or spaced around your times appearing at arrive can hearings for the Government Operations Committee. For example, before your appearance at the Government Operations Committee on the 24th of October in last year, you visited the Prime Minister's office at 2 p.m., mm -hmm. then walked across the street and sat down to take, uh, to take questions. The next morning, you were back at the Prime Minister's office. Who did you meet with in these meetings? I have not met with the Prime Minister. The Privy Council office is in that building. I would have been at 80 Wellington to attend um, meetings with colleagues in the Privy Council office. So none of your meetings at 80 Wellington had any relation to the Arrive Can, uh, the Arrive Can scandal or your testimony at this committee? No. I, I have spoken to colleagues in the Privy Council office about Arrive Can. Certainly there's a big public profile to Arrive Can. They've had questions, um, but uh, you're, you're linking specific meetings and specific appearances here that have no relation to one another. I have come to give this testimony free of, of putting anything by anybody else. So the suggestion that I would have been meeting with the Privy Council office in advance of this meeting is not accurate. My calendar shows many, many meetings at 80 Wellington. You did meet with people uh, at that office before this meeting. So it is accurate to suggest that. It's, it's an assertion of fact. So you just said it's inaccurate to say that you met there before this meeting. You did, ma'am. Not on arrive, Ken. Okay. Well, um, it's... Uh, it's certainly interesting that your appearances at the um, Privy Council office or the Prime Minister's office um, are directly around your appearances at, at this committee. I think you'll In see many, many meetings at 80 Wellington around all sorts of other meetings. spoke to colleagues in the Privy Council office about, uh, about this meeting. Did you speak about your testimony at this committee with, with uh, folks at PCO? I didn't say that I met with colleagues about this meeting, um, but I did indicate that I was coming. I indicated that I was coming, and um, I shared my opening remarks with them. They didn't, uh, they acknowledged receipt. On October 13, 2022, there was a meeting in your calendar uh, that was Procurement Services uh, Canada and CBSA on ArriveCan, PSPC, PSPC and CBSA ArriveCan. Did you attend that meeting? Say the title of the meeting again. October 13, 2022, PSPC and CBSA, Arrive Can. Did you attend the meeting? I, I don't recollect if it was in my calendar. Um, I, I likely did, but I don't recollect that meeting in particular. Well, it seems that the meeting would have been important to your committee strategy because we have an email um, on October 21st where it stated, quote, both PSPC and CBSA push to have all departments do remarks if they can for time management and putting our narrative out there. So it seems like there was a time management strategy uh, developed. It relates directly to um, your appearance at, at committee. Do you have any recollection of it now with, with that uh, having been offered? Sorry. Would you be able to uh, table for this committee would you be able to table for this committee um, the uh, uh, prep materials that you would have had or a, or a slide deck? Um, do you have the title of the slide deck on, uh, on um, lessons learned, uh, Arrive Can Lessons Learned? Are you familiar with that document? I am. Could you table that with the committee? Uh, I believe if, if it's the one I'm thinking of, um, it was presented to the Treasury Board. Um, but yes, I can. You undertake to present to provide that to the committee. Thank you. The uh, the PCO in the documents that we reviewed also said that they wanted to review all documentation being requested by the committee. Were they was PCO involved with uh, any of the redactions to the documents? Um, CBSA was non-compliant with a legal order of this committee to provide full documents, um, and. Uh, we want to know if PCO was involved in uh, the restricting of the release of information um, that was lawfully requested by this standing committee. CBSA makes redactions to its own documents. So 
What was PCO's interest then in reviewing all of the documentation before it was being submitted to the committee? Great. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Mr. Sousa, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to both witnesses for being here today. Um, Mr. O'Gorman, have Butler cooperated in discussions? Have you had any discussions with any of the principals? I've not spoken uh, personally with either of the principals. As I said, um, we invited them to provide any material that was pertinent um, to the investigation. Um, I have received uh, three letters from um, Ms. Dutt um, over the course of my time here. I have not spoken to her personally. Yeah, and, and so some of the concerns the committee has is the way it, per, it was proceeding uh, or it took shape, as you've rightly noted in your opening uh, remarks, um, that they didn't actually have a contract. Um, in fact, we're not really certain still as to what they were prepared to do or what was being asked of them, given that they were being proactive in their presentation to government, and nor did GC Strategies have a contract. I know that was some inference made to that. Can you explain what has developed here in your mind? Recognizing that there will be further information and uh, an internal investigation, based on the information that I've seen, there was engagement with officials from CBSA, GC Strategies, Botler, Cordex and Dalian, getting involved in how, how the work of Botler would be brought to bear at CBSA. And that is what was presented to the RCMP. Am I not mistaken on that? That's what was given to them? The allegations by Botler were passed to the RCMP. And none of that is anything to do with the Rife can. Is that correct? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the answer. I can't hear. Uh, Mr. Can Chair, I think I... Okay. Uh, so, um, so RCMP is not investigating a rive can, but you are. You're taking initial steps, is that correct? Am I, am I, is that, is that what this committee is being apprised of? Investigation is looking into um, procurement practices at CBSA, um, following on, frankly, the allegations that were provided by Botler. So Botler brought to the attention of, of myself some allegations that, if founded, would be extremely serious. Those were the basis for the launch of the investigation, and the investigation is, is pursuing the information, I assume, based on what it is seeing and hearing um, in terms of the people they talk to and the documents they obtain. Right. And so your disclosure and your engagement um, is to try to uncover as much as possible what has taken place. You're not trying to hide anything. You're actually trying to uncover more. I want to understand what happened, and I want to protect the integrity of the investigation and give it the time and space it needs to conclude. Mr. Osowski, can you position what occurred at that time, given the urgency of the pandemic? Back to the creation of the app? Yes. Um, well, as I said in my opening remarks, um, it was an incredibly tense moment in history, certainly in the history of the Border Services Agency. Um, no one, I don't believe, before me had ever shut down the border before and still tried to make sure that commercial trade <clears throat> and essential food and medicine was coming across. And I was spending a lot of time with my American colleagues to make sure that the messaging was the same. They've got a different legal construct in terms of how airports work, but the land border was the primary concern given that's where most of the commercial trade comes <coughs> through so, to Canada and back yeah, and no, forth. So, so it, it was a massive urgency, a massive border, uh, one of the largest, the largest, I guess, uh, in the world. And you had an issue of public safety uh, at the forefront. And now some are suggesting maybe there was too many or there were some shortcomings in the way things were pr processed. Can you explain what, did, were there any shortcomings in, in, your, in your view? The application development was processed? 
Yes. Um, and, and the procurement. Look, as I said in my opening remarks, we got the request and four days later, my team had put together mock-ups of what the application could look like. So we already had some uh, basic capabilities on this in the organization, but to do something as quickly and get things approved through an app store, both Android and Apple, was gonna require extra help. Um, the team had something ready to go uh, for a soft launch. I believe it was in the middle of April or just towards the end of April. Uh, and then it was fully launched. So it was a very, very tight time frame. Absolutely not normal in terms of the normal way we would procure any IT project or anything like this. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> Were we running at 150 miles an hour? Absolutely. Um, but this was a pandemic. People were dying. I think I remember at the, at the Sorry, time when we I shut the border, 100,000 people I have to had cut died. you off there, Mr. Osowski. Thanks, Mr. Susa. Uh, Mr. Susa. Uh, Mr. Genoas, over to you, please. So, Ms. O'Gorman, two senior public servants involved in the Arrive Can affair, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Otano, provided highly detailed and critical testimony to this committee on November the 7th, 2023, about what happened in uh, Arrive Can. Um, they didn't toe the line. They were very critical of you directly, uh, as well as of Mr. Doan and indirectly, I think, of Minister Mendicino. Uh, my impression was that they did not intend to be uh, critical in particular, but they simply provided direct and forthright answers to direct questions. Uh, and we would welcome that from others as well. But in any event, after their testimony, immediately after their testimony, it seems that you, Im you ordered an investigation related to their conduct. Is that correct? You didn't order any investigation after their testimony? Their dismissal letters say that on November 27th, 2023, they were made aware of investi uh, investigation by the Canadian Border Services Agency. Were they made aware of an investigation on November 27, 2023? So in the course of conducting an investigation, at some point, individuals, if there are allegations against them, are formally informed of those allegations. Okay, so so, so they were, I think they were informed, to they were informed of an, that they were the subject of an investigation regarding serious allegations of misconduct, allegedly. They were informed of that on November 27th, suspiciously, just a few weeks after their testimony before this committee. So are you, are you claiming that that information was related to investigation that was actually launched prior to their testimony? Well, when, when was that investigation launched? There's one investigation that was launched in November of 2022. So, but then they were informed of what? The expansion of that investigation, a part of that investigation, or they were simply informed that they were the subject of particular complaints on November 27, 2023? My understanding is they were informed of the allegations against them. So there was the information... Were these the new allegations or allegations that had been longstanding? So Butler AI presented allegations to the agency... The investigation that has been followed is consistent with any investigation undertaken by CBSA. Ma'am, I'd like, I'd like direct responses here. What I'm trying to understand is that a couple weeks after their appearance before this committee, they were informed of serious investigation into their own conduct. You're telling us that it just so happened that there were new re revelations related to an ongoing investigation. There's new revelations. The but then why were they only told of this on November 27th? Were they, was, was information simply kept from them for a long time? Or, or, because you'd have to agree the timing is a little bit odd, isn't it? I don't agree with that. The investigation really? has been carried out consistent really? with our investigations. I have not spoken to the investigators. The process is such that when... Okay, okay ma'am. So, so pure, pure coincidence. They come on November 7th. They are very critical of you personally. And then, and then two weeks later, slightly more, they are told that they are under a cloud of investigation. And subsequently, you send a preliminary finding of fact to their bosses, which leads to them both being suspended without pay, all in a few months succession after their 
uh, after their appearance at this testimony. They are, uh, their, their legal support is withdrawn as a result of a decision you made, which you claim is in keeping with Treasury Board guidelines. All of this in weeks and months immediately after they came and criticized you at this committee. And you're telling us that, that, had not, that that's pure coincidence. Is that what you're telling us? Is the suggestion that I'm interfering in the investigation? Because there is no information to support that. Ma'am, ma ma I'm, I'm, pointing out, I'm pointing out the timeline. But here's what I would like you to do. I'd like you to provide the preliminary statement of fact that you provided to their superiors to this committee within 48 hours. Will you undertake to do that? I'll say two things. No, no, no. Will you provide that document? The preliminary statement of fact. Will you provide that document, ma'am? At a point in time. Will you and provide that document? Of my no, no, yeah, I'm, answer, I'm asking you a question. Act. And right now. You know, ma'am, you, you talk about your concern about the integrity of the investigation, but you have told this committee, you've chosen to publicly testify that you believe that Mr. Utano and Mr. McDonald have behaved inappropriately. You have said that on the record at the same time as claiming you don't want to compromise the investigation. And you made the decision. Uh, to to uh, send those letters immediately after uh, they gave testimony at this committee critical of you. So if you won't answer my question, I hope the committee will agree with me to order the production of that preliminary statement of fact that you sent to the superiors of Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano, and I'd put it to the committee that we order the production of those documents within 48 hours. That's not a question. That's, that's to the chair. Okay. Because I Thanks. think I'm out of time. And <laughs> we are, but I will ask... Colleagues, are we fine? Mr. Shawari, you want to respond on th to that? Yeah, the same, the same comment as I did yesterday with uh, Mr. Gorjohn. If we can have it in writing both official languages, I would appreciate that. And as usual, we always support the, uh, any type of production of documents. Sorry, it's, it's, I, it's, I've, 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 I've stated it clearly. Je peux dire le même en français. Ah, I can say the same in French. We have interpretation services. Preliminary statement of fact that Ms. O'Gorman sent um, to the, the, um, the, the, the direct bosses of Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano that led to their, um, that led to their suspension. Uh, I'm, I'm requesting gonna, that the committee order yeah, the production I'm of those documents. I'm going to interrupt, because we're out of time. We're going to try and get that translated and sent around, and perhaps we can address it in um, a bit later in the meeting. So we'll get the translation sent around to everyone. If you could just provide and separate to uh, our clerk exactly what you're looking for so we can move forward on that. Uh, Mr. Clean Baines, order, Mr. we Chief. will <coughs> go ahead, Ms. Atwood. Order? Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, Mr. Genuis, if you can just uh, lean back from the mic a little bit when you're speaking, it's just, it's hard on our ears and I'm sure it's hard on interpretation. I just wanted to okay. put that out there. Thanks. We'll Thank pass you. it on. Mr. Baines, we'll try you again. Hopefully, uh, IT thinks they've got you fixed, so uh, we'll go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'm hoping everybody can hear me correctly now in translation and everything's okay. All good? So far, okay. so good. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, okay, so I'll, I'm going to go to uh, um, Ms. O'Gorman. Uh, if you can, so we know Arrive Can is not being investigated. Um, as you're aware, the Office of the Auditor General has been working on a report of Arrive Can. And last she was here, she was disappointed that this matter had not been brought to her attention. Are you keeping in good, good contact with her office to make sure she has what she needs for her work? Yeah, that was my decision not to provide that to the Auditor General at the time because the allegations related to another contract. Um, in hindsight, I recognize they were the same individuals and they were the same company. I probably ought to have informed them of that, including the caveats that we knew nothing further. We have appreciated the work with the Auditor General. Our teams have worked closely with them. I look forward to her report and I expect that she'll have some, some good recommendations. So you're referencing, you said, same individuals, same companies. Can you name them, please? As they've been named here, um, GC Strategies uh, among the companies, and the individuals have already been named as well and, and are included in the email disclosure that uh, was in the package that I provided. So, so, uh, and... So procurement practices at CBSA is ultimately what we're looking at, what you're looking at. Um, so in light of what we've been hearing at committee these past months, 
do you have faith in your organization's ability overall to follow fair procurement practices? Like uh, you, everything that we've heard, um, you know, do you think the system is working? Um, and and your fault, your the practices that you're trying to either improve, or are you seeing some changes, or you're bringing changes forward? Um, if you can maybe share some something on that. Faith and confidence in the people at CBSA, absolutely. CBSA does a lot of procurement of goods, of services. There are no specific concerns I have. Um, as regards contracting, staff augmentation, information technology, I have seen that you know in some cases uh, files were not complete. I've seen uh, engagements with um, vendors, with contractors that didn't involve procurement officials, unclear roles and responsibilities. That's what I'm looking to fix. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to Mr. Um, Ozowski. As you know, like part of our role here as members of OGO is to provide recommendations to government. Has your experience in this process, what you've witnessed here and your appearance here, um, led to any insights or recommendations that could improve uh, the procurement process? The question. Um, I would say I'm not privy to all of the information that certainly might come up from the Auditor General's work or the Procurement Ombudsman, but I'm certain that the agency would receive and the government would receive any recommendations to improve procurement um, gratefully. Okay, thank you. And um, in, you know, for the um, federal information technology projects such as ArriveCan, Arrive and, and, and I think we've determined here, and from what you've mentioned earlier also, it was developed in record time um, and under dire circumstances and, and ultimately saved money uh, when you were talking about how uh, the process was in paper form and, and people filling out and, and, and the time saved and, and you know, do you feel that that was good value for taxpayers' dollars, the, the decision that was being made at that time? And so, as I mentioned, I don't think anyone could have predicted how many iterations and versions of the app there would be and all of the different tools that were built into it for things like vaccine certificates and holding people's health care information and personal information. Um, so it was something that started off as a very modest, simple application to take contact tracing information and pass that along, and it grew into something incredibly sophisticated. Um, and so from that perspective and what I was talking about with Mr. Jawari, I think it was definitely more effective than a paper-based process. Uh, in retrospect, if this were to happen again, I'm sure there's lessons learned about how we would do this better. Um, but um, other than that, I, I don't have any comment. That is our time. Thanks, Mr. Baines. Thank you again for your flexibility. Uh, Mrs. Vignola for two and a half, please. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. Osowski, when did the pandemic start officially in Canada? That I, I would have to go back and check, but somewhere in, in the middle of March 2020. Yes, and in the emails that we received, uh, we were told about MOBO, I think that stands for Mobile Border, uh, as early as 2019. So is Mobile Border the uh, predecessor of ArriveCan? Was this project already underway before the pandemic? Don't recollect re uh, the details of the mobile border. I think that was actually for officers to use internally so that they had something as a mobile tool to use when they were going on tour buses. But I, I would have to go back and check with the agency on that one. Perhaps Ms. O'Gorman knows. Um, Madam O'Gorman, I have a question about language. I won't uh, repeat what I said before, but... Uh, language C, C++, a specialist can be francophone from uh, um, either Quebec or another Canadian province and wouldn't be able to speak English perfectly. I know unilingual anglophones who still make mistakes in English. So why 
require English w when your public servants are supposed to be bilingual and supposed to be able to communicate in both official languages with different um, contractors. There's a difference between bilingualism in applications and services given to Canadians and internal work for IT employees. According to my understanding, the working language that is most commonly used is English. In the market, la, the working language is English. And that is why when we wrote up that request, we made the knowledge of the English language a mandatory requirement. Most people who work within IT work in English. Concepts are discussed in English. Unfortunately... I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Johns, over to you, please. Uh, first, I want to give uh, Ms. O'Gorman just uh, a really quick chance to respond to uh, Mr. Genius's uh, question. She wasn't given a chance to reply. I wanted to know if she wanted to take that opportunity. I would just say that CBSA is conducting this investigation in the same way that it conducts all investigations. And that's very important, and it's important for the people of CBSA to see that, that we don't do things differently based on people's levels. And so the team is carrying out the investigation. There are established steps supported by jurisprudence. I'm not involved in talking to the investigators. I am certainly not directing anything related to that investigation. I receive updates. When I received a document, I shared it with the relevant deputy heads. So we are conducting that investigation in a way that is absolutely consistent with others. The public profile is certainly making it a challenge. We want to wrap it up quickly, and we want all those involved to um, participate in the investigation, meet with the investigators. Thank you for the opportunity to make that clear. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to move a motion. It's a procedural motion from last uh, meeting, um, and the motion reads, and it's been circulated in both official languages, that the clerk inform Vaughn Brennan that the committee sends for all records of communications from January 1st, 2019 through the present between Vaughn Brennan and Riddick Dutt, Amir Morv, and any other persons acting as or on behalf of Bottler AI, including communications by email, call, text message, or any other method, and that the information be provided to the clerk of the committee no later than 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 1st, 2024. Thanks. Mr. Johns, just to confirm, this is the one uh, you had uh, brought forward yesterday? Yes. Mr. Sousa, your hands up. Is it on this issue or? Yes, it is. Go just ahead, Mr. say that uh, we will support this motion. Agreed. Thanks very much. Consider it done, Mr. Johns. Thanks very much for your patience with that. And you've got about five seconds left, so. I'd like to move <laughs> another motion, Mr. Chair, if I could. Um, and uh, this this motion I'd like to speak to as well. Um, one, one, first... one second, Mr. Ba or Mr. Johns. Mr. Johns, you're basically out of time. Can you do it in your, we have one more round coming up. Could you do it in the last round, please? Okay, it's my understanding that uh, I can move motions in my time, and it suspends. You were actually you were actually out of time, but uh, I said the five seconds. But could you save it for the next round, please? Okay. We we will have time in the meeting, though. You don't have to worry. Okay. We're not going to finish right at three. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johns. Um, Mr. Please. A hard time reconciling the fact that you said you were at the Prime Minister's Department, but it wasn't about arrive can but it was immediately before your appearance here and when pressed in my questions to you, you said that you focus grouped your opening remarks to your, um, your colleagues uh, who work in the Prime Minister's Department at that allegedly unrelated meeting. Um, I find it hard to believe, I think Canadians would find that hard to believe, um, who was there from the Prime Minister's office at that meeting? I've not met with anybody from the Prime Minister's office. Was, who was at that meeting? who works in the Prime Minister's office. If you mean the building, I was meeting with 
Privy Council Office officials. My question is very is very clear. You were at a meeting. It's in your calendar. You were acknowledged that you acknowledged that you were at the meeting. Was there anyone from the Prime Minister's office in attendance at that meeting? No. That, there was no one. Okay. So it was just PCO that you focus grouped your remarks for this committee with. The on, on page, provided them. Uh, on page 180 of the emails that you provided to this committee, it talks about time management strategy for your appearance before this committee and that PCO wanted to review all the documentation being requested by this committee. Something else that you, you seem unaware of. So you're, you're taking meetings immediately before and immediately after your appearance at this committee with the Prime Minister's Department, PCO. They're reviewing all of the documentation that's coming from your office, your, your department, which illegally... Uh, Ill illegally refused document production orders of this committee and you're telling us that that all of these meetings at PCO that are happening directly around your appearances at this committee are unrelated and and uh, though you, you do acknowledge that you uh, did circulate your opening remarks in advance but there was no discussion at this allegedly unrelated meeting. Is, do I understand that correctly? I'm not even sure where to begin to answer that so I've attended meetings at the best place to start absolutely. and that, that would be and that'd I, be a wonderful change. I have been absolutely honest and forthright with this committee. So the meeting you're asking about preceded my previous appearance at OGO. Is that the, the meeting? Chair, I'm not getting an answer. I'll, I'll give the rest of my time to my colleague. Mr. Gorman, given the extremely seriousness of this matter, with both the RCMP and the Auditor General now investigating this boondoggle of the Arrive Can app procurement and the $54 million cost, you surely, as the president of the CBSA, would be keeping your minister, Dominic LeBlanc, the Minister of Public Safety, fully apprised of all developments. Is that correct? I informed the minister that I had received preliminary statements of fact that were of concern and that I was providing them to the deputy heads. Did you provide Mr. LeBlanc with a copy of those findings? No. Why not? I didn't think that he, uh, well, he didn't ask for it. How many meetings have you had with uh, Minister Le LeBlanc with respect to this investigation? We've had no meetings. I called him to inform him. How many I, calls have you had with him? On the, the one call. How many emails have you shared with Dominic LeBlanc? I sent him one email. Previous to Dominic LeBlanc was Marco Mendicino in that role as the Minister of Public Safety. Did you communicate with him as well? I called him to inform him of the allegations I received. And, and his response was? He was concerned with the nature of them. He expressed his expectation that I would shore up any gaps and... Um, informed me that I should keep him apprised if, uh, if there were any developments that he needed to be aware of. All your communications, were they via telephone or email? Um, I don't recall emailing the previous minister. I may have. Okay. If you have, you will, you will look back at your email, email chain with respect to both ministers, and you'll provide copies uh, to this committee within seven days. Is that okay? Now, last question. Lying before this committee has become a serious problem with a number of witnesses. It's almost a culture of lying and deceit. Although you've not been sworn to tell the truth, there's a presumption you are telling the truth when you appear at committee. Mr. McDonald, the now suspended public servant over the Arrive Can app, said that you lied, specifically targeting you for mistruths that you provided to committee uh, this past fall. Um, have you told the committee the truth and nothing but the truth today? I have told the committee the answers to the questions truthfully and to the best of my recollection. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Uh, we're going to uh, Ms. Atwood now, please, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have one quick question for Mr. Gorman, and then I'll be uh, directing most of my questions to Mr. Osowski. Um, I just have one piece that I'm confused about, about when the contract was cancelled with Butler. Was it due to issues with deliverables, or was it because of the misconduct allegations that it came forward? My understanding is uh, that it was cancelled because CBSA didn't feel that it had... Uh, it it had a need to continue with the contract. I don't know the details. 
Um, I don't know who made that decision, but that's my understanding. Okay. Um, Mr. Osowski, I don't know if you have any additional comment to that. Um, thank you for the question. No, in fact, I have no recollection of the contract or the task authorizations with Butler. The, the meeting I had with them where I got the demo uh, was my interaction with them, and there were some subsequent emails back and forth that we talked to about the last time I appeared, but that's it. I wasn't involved in the task authorizations. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to, to remind kind of our whole committee about the, the Treasury Board contracting policy. Um, so ideally, we want government contracting uh, to be conducted in a manner that will stand the test of public scrutiny in matters of prudence and probity, facilitate access, encourage competition, and reflect fairness in the spending of public funds. So in other words, fair, open, and transparent. Um, so Mr. Osowski, in your view, ha has scrutiny of the ArriveCAN procurement process or allegations of wrongdoing from Botler revealed any shortcomings of the federal integrity regime for public procurement? So I've retired and those investigations have started by both internally that Ms. O'Gorman is doing within the agency and then the procurement ombudsman and the auditor general. I'm sure that they will find things that could be improved in the process, but I think that should be caveated with what was happening at that particular point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, and it's been argued at this committee and, and in the news uh, that staffing firms like GC Strategies bring no added value to government projects like the Arrive Can app. Um, yet they received contracts worth millions of dollars for the specific project. Um, can you explain just in your point of view, what value, if any, staffing firms bring to government projects? I think you've heard testimony. Thank you for the question. I think you've heard testimony from several witnesses that getting qualified to access the government contracting regime is burdensome and complicated. It's not just about security screening. There's all kinds of things around intellectual property and access to buildings um, and it's very hard for small individual firms to do this on on their own so they go to these staffing agencies these people that have specific skills and talent um, and they make themselves available to these firms who do qualify to provide these services um, <clears throat> the government uses these firm these services regularly for unique skill sets um, mr johns has been on record that public servants should be doing this and and I agree. I think, quite frankly, that <clears throat> if I had to have a, a recommendation around this is that public servants should be doing what I would call run, which is maintaining the systems, patches, things like that. And the private sector should be used for bringing in innovation. Um, and that's where uh, there's probably a, a shift that I think would be beneficial. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Barrett alluded to a uh, you know, potential document called Lessons Learned, you know, Arrive Kid. Um, you know, just in, in your opinion, again, and based on your experience, uh, you know, even with this committee, um, what lessons has CBSA or should CBSA have learned from the Arrive Can project regarding the use of, of intermediaries like GC strategies or, or in process in general? You know, what lessons can we learn from this? Thank you for the question. I mean, I think that uh, all of the investigations and audits that are being conducted right now will yield all kinds of lessons learned for the agency to take on hand, and I'm sure that they will. Great, thank you. Um, and, and lastly, uh, you know, is there anything that you would have done personally different uh, in this situation in hindsight, right? We have the, you know, hindsight 2020, if we could look back and fix things, um, would you personally have done anything different as, as the acting president? And I'll start with a bit of a joke. I'd wish I'd never opened up the president of public health agency's email uh, asking <laughs> for an app. Um, but that, that said, um, in, <laughs> um, that said uh, look, we were moving very, very quickly. Everybody was making their best efforts to respond to the public health agency's requirements here to get this information. Um, and uh, I, 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 I'm grateful and I'm very proud of what the agency did during that period of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And back to Mr. Genuas, please. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Can I uh, ask uh, both of our witnesses just very briefly? Min Doan has said he's proud of the Arrive Can app. Um, is that your position as well? Are you are you are you both proud of the Arrive Can app? Yes, I'm. I'm very proud okay. of the app, and I, and I'll if I may, I would just expand on that a little bit. I don't have a huge amount of time, so you okay, your, very quickly. The future of travel, and many countries are doing this, are all reliant on an application of this type of nature. 
getting advance information on the, people is critical. Okay. To the, the yeah. Fire. I mean, my question was about the arrive can app specifically, but go ahead, uh, Ms. O'Gorman. Thank you for your response, Mr. Osowski. Continue to use it on a voluntary basis. About 300,000 travelers a month are using are, it. Are you, are you proud of it? It worked. It performed. It did its job. Is this yes or no? Are you, are, you, are you proud of it? To, yes. Okay. Um, back to my previous line of questioning. So, so um, Ms. O'Gorman, um, I think you understand that when it comes to issues of conflict of interest, public servants has to avoid, have to avoid the reality and the appearance of conflict of interest. Um, and I think a similar principle would apply to professional retaliation, that it's important to avoid the reality and the appearance of people facing professional retaliation for speaking to this committee. Um, uh, you know, by, by analogy, sometimes the horse's head is in the bed just because it's a convenient place to put it, but more often than not, it might be interpreted as a message. Um, we, we had at this committee on November 7th, Mr. McDonald testifying that you and that CBSA lied about who was responsible for choosing GC strategies. 20 days after that, they received a letter saying that they were under investigation. And this was a new letter to them. Uh, and then about a month after that, they were advised that you had made the decision that their legal fees would not be covered. So you can tell us that that was not professional retaliation for their testimony before the committee. And, and whether it was purely intended as retaliation or not requires us to assess your motivation, something that's, that's obviously difficult to do externally. But don't you think it, it obviously looks like retaliation and would likely have the effect of chilling public servants who would otherwise be interested in and willing to come before this committee and give <coughs> honest, frank testimony? The fact that so shortly after their testimony, you made the decision to pull their, the support for their legal fees and that they received a letter saying they were under investigation which led them to be suspended from their jobs without pay. Does that not have the appearance, at least, of professional retaliation against them and their careers as a result of testimony they gave to the Government Operations Committee? Yeah. Sorry, let me just interrupt. Mr. Sousa, do you have a point of order? Yeah, if Mr. Jennings could just sort of step back a bit. It's, it's hard to... It's very staticky uh, when he speaks so close to the mic. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Jean or go ahead. Um, uh, my question was to the witness. Go ahead. I'm not retaliating against anybody. I'm trying to find out what happened. Do, do, <laughs> do you think it looks like retaliation, that these, these events happened to occur uh, that had severe negative implications for their career immediately following their testimony before this committee? that all decisions that were taken were taken by the accountable people. You reference um, legal I'm, I'm fees. confident that you're, you're not answering the questions, th though. Uh, I, 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 this isn't my first committee hearing, and this isn't your first committee hearing. My question was, would you not agree that this looks like a, a scheme to retaliate and punish public servants who were critical of you, your leadership, and others within CBSA? that it is, and I'm telling you that I'm not retaliating against anybody. It, 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 I don't really believe you, but in any event, it sure looks that way. Can, can you provide some other explanation as to why, immediately after they came to this committee, they said they were threatened by other public servants and that nothing was done on that? They said that you and others had lied to this committee and then you're the one who gets to decide whether or not the department covers their legal fees. And, and you, perhaps unsurprisingly, make the decision to pull their legal fees. Doesn't that look like you made a decision to punish people that criticized you at a parliamentary committee? I approved their legal fees for their first appearance. I received no request. Yes, I have no you, re you, you approved their legal fees before they appeared. And they're coming back to this committee. I'll give it to you in a moment. They came to this committee, they were supported with their legal fees before they appeared, but after you heard what they said, you pulled their, their support, and next time they come before this committee, they will not have the support for their legal fees as a result of a decision you made. Because now you know what they're going to say. Is that not the case, ma'am? No. They have not asked for legal support for their appearance, and they have been encouraged to make that request so that I can render an answer for that. They have not asked for legal fees for their appearance before 
this committee coming up. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going now to Mr. Back to Mr. Baines, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe I was ceding my time to uh, Ms. Atwin. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we, we've we've talked a lot. Um, we've kind of gone in circles a little bit on some of these questions today. Um, but I really, I, I want to thank our witnesses um, for your patience, uh, your tenacity. Um, and I mean, it, it hasn't been easy. Um, and I, I'd like to, to caution um, also some of our, our colleagues uh, in the committee for some of the harshness of their words and insinuations. Um, we really need to be careful about how we how we conduct ourselves and we need to treat our witnesses uh, with respect because they've given their time to come here today. And again, I think each of us wants to get to the bottom of this. And I think that's what, what the the point is, what we're trying to do. And I think it can be done in a manner um, that's becoming of, of parliamentarians. Um, so in saying that, um, Ms. O'Gorman, I, I asked Mr. Osowski, you know, if, if he would have done anything different during that experience, um, but you know, where you're, you're here in the seat now, you're in this important role. Um, you, you've already initiated some key changes around procurement moving forward, which, which I think is great. Are there any other lessons you can take away from this? I think every day, the people of CBSA are doing outstanding work. I'm very concerned about the public nature of this investigation. I ask myself whether anything could have been done. It was duly provided to the professional standards people who have undertaken investigation. I've assured myself that the process is consistent with any investigations they would undertake in the CBSA. I need the people of the agency to have confidence in these processes. That is my absolute preoccupation. We have discussions about accountability, about values and ethics. The people of CBSA are doing excellent work, and it's an organization of accountability. People in CBSA, frontline officers, take decisions every day, and they have those decisions tested in court. It's an organization that understands accountability. I'm trying to get to the bottom of what happened. I'm impatient to do so, and I regret that the people involved have to have the added stress of the public aspect of this. I look forward to a final investigation, and as I've said, I will take any additional um, actions that, uh, that support any of the findings of that. Thank you. Um, and do you have any kind of general comments just as a as a witness, um, as, as someone appearing before a parliamentary committee like this? Um, how has your experience been? It's difficult to be um, accused of lying uh, in a general sense. Um, as I said, I have provided truthful testimony. I have provided and continue to provide the materials that were requested. And I stand ready to continue answering questions. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Osowski, now that you're, again, kind of on the other side of things, um, you know, I think about um, what lessons for us that you'd really like us to learn. I, I kind of ask this question, but as far as, as recommendations moving forward, we've got a couple of reports we're looking forward to. We've got the Auditor General's report. Um, there's a look into uh, procurement processes more more broadly as far as the, the Ombuds report. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, for us, what's the main takeaway? What what do you want us to have, you know, taken from these you know, few months of discussions, um, kind of the back and forth exchanges? What, what can we do better um, as committee members and as parliamentarians? The question, I think the only thing I would offer is that... Um, to, to uh, my colleague Aaron's point, is that these processes um, take time um, and that the committee is hungry for all kinds of answers and information, and I, I totally understand that. But I think there's a, an appropriate balance to be struck in terms of ensuring um, a fair process for all the people involved. And so I think there's, um, there's some thought that could be given to that in terms of uh, the demands of information versus the due process that needs to unfold. Thank you. Um, and, and Ms. O'Gorman, you alluded to the idea that we need to have, you know, faith in disciplinary processes as well. We need to be assured, each of us, um, that if there's wrongdoing, that there will be, um, you know, you'll have to you have to meet, uh, you know, the 
the decisions and you'll have to to feel the repercussions of that. Um, and I have faith that that's going to happen. And I'm just wondering, you know, do you have faith that that will happen as well? That will happen. Great. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Just on time. Thanks very much, uh, Mrs. Vignola, for your final two and a half. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, I'd like to um, complete the comment I was making earlier. When in the language requirement, there is a requirement to be Anglophone and the option to be a Francophone, it sends a message. The message sent to Franco-Canadians and Quebecers who are specialized in this field is that regardless of their skills and capacity in the field, it will never be enough. And that Canada is willing to miss out on, on someone that could be a specialist in their field because they have to speak English. And it's not just in technology. There's, there's a requirement for English in so many fields. The message is that Canada is willing to pass on this the specialists in their field because they simply don't speak, quote-unquote, the right language. That's the message this government has been sending in so many fields. So it should be taken into account. There are Spanish specialists, Japanese specialists, all of whom don't speak English, who work in technology and IT at very high levels. So that's my comment. I just think it should be taken into account. Now, here's my question. Do the same teams usually work with the same vendors? For instance, ArriveCAN and Butler AI. Is this standard practice given the nature of these contracts? I don't know if I can give you a definitive answer. It has to do with perception. Um, microphone was often audible. Now, talking about lawyers, given that Mr. Itano and Mr. McDonald no longer work for CBSA, that they've moved on to two other organizations, why are you still in charge of authorizing the payment of their lawyer fees? Because the case is linked to activities that took place while they were working for the agency. And so these people's lawyers have sent let have they sent letters to other witnesses in this case telling them to speak up or to not talk without is it possible that it could have happened? If it did, I have not been informed. 